The title is All the Languages Together. So uh, let me start off by pointing out that there are a lot of programming languages out there. Um, you know, here are a bunch of logos from most of the general purpose ones, but there are numerous DSLs. You might write a whole bunch yourself at work. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, um, is how do we go about making it easier to use a mix of languages when developing software? All right. So there are many good reasons for wanting to use different languages at the same time in the same software system. Um, we, so this is almost sort of cliche by now that different languages are suited for different tasks. So for instance, if you're writing an application in OCaml, perhaps you have uh, some memory intensive or performance intensive component that you want to go and implement in Rust. Um, maybe as part of the same application, you need to implement some sort of a protocol so you can use something like a DSL called Regal, which lets you um, r easily write down finite state machines. Um, other reasons, you could have an existing code base. Maybe you've been stuck with it for a while and along comes a nice new nifty programming language and you'd like to start using that, but you can't throw away your existing code base. So that's another reason for wanting to be able to use multiple languages together at the same time in an application. Um, now that said, developing multi-language software is hard. Uh, the world just isn't sort of set up to do this too easily. Uh, so normally we just sort of make do. Uh, every language has a CFFI or Java has a JNI. So you, you I mean, it's, you can always have your language talk to C. If you need to talk to another language, you might need to, get to get, go through the CFFI to talk to that other language because you don't know how to talk to each other directly. Um, the other sort of popular approach is microservices. Um, so here you basically take your application and you split it up into um, sort of pieces and then you figure out how you want to talk across these different services. The issue with this is, you know, it, it works very well, but um, the issue with this is that we're sort of stuck with a coarse-grained rather than a fine-grained approach. There's really nothing out there that lets us mix languages together in a more fine-grained fashion if we want to sometimes. Now, there are other issues with developing multi-language software. You know, there's been a, a lot of people have uh, spent time and effort on uh, tools that help you reduce boilerplate. Um, and there are many issues to do with tooling and IDE support. So for instance, if you have an identifier in one language and you need to then refer to it from another, you know, it would be nice if the IDEs provided support for those kind of cross-language links. This talk is not about tooling support. I will say something about tooling support at the, towards the end. Um, but let me get to what this talk is about and what kind of multi-language software mixing I, I want. So I'm going to start with an example. Um, suppose that you have an OCaml application and you want to write part of, you know, you, you need to use Rust to write some high performance component. So I'm not going to show you a whole application or, you know, tons of code, but I'm going to show you something small and idealized. Let me actually start, so it's the OCaml that's calling the Rust, but let me start with the Rust side. So here we have um, two uh, functions um, that uh, there's an alloc buffer, so Rust, in Rust we're going to allocate a vector and pass it over to OCaml. Um, and then when OCaml is done with that vector, uh, we are going to get, uh, OCaml is going to call this return buffer function and, uh, you know, essentially pass it back to Rust. Now, what uh, alloc buffer is doing is it's, uh, it's basically allocating this vector with capacity two. So for those of you who don't know how vectors work in Rust, in, a vector in Rust is basically a struct with three fields. It has a pointer, a capacity, and a length. The capacity is how much memory you have total, and the length is how many fields you've filled up so far, uh, so how many uh, slots you've filled up so far. So we push a number into it, and we pass it over to OCaml. Uh, and then when we come back, um, a return buffer will just sort of uh, get, uh, take the vector and go and update uh, slot one in that vector. OK. So, oops. Um, here's the OCaml code. So first, uh, let me just sort of step through the categories of this. First, we just have to do some boilerplate work because uh, we need to type vec so that we can get the pointer capacity and length. Um, but here is our declaration for the uh, foreign functions, the alloc buffer and, and return buffer that are sitting in Rust. Um, and then what do we actually do? Well, uh, we call alloc buffer here. And uh, we get a vector, and it's v. And then we uh, do the bookkeeping to get the pointer, the capacity, and the length, and uh, the actual pointer to the buffer. 
Uh, then uh, we do sensible things. Uh, we basically go ahead and we store at um, uh, we store at slot one of that vector, and we update the length. So we're being good citizens. We're updating the length to two, all right? Because we've just pushed another thing onto that vector, uh, and then we return the buffer back to, to Rust. Now, notice the very last line. Um, after I return the buffer to uh, to Rust, OCaml is still using it. You can continue to go and, up, uh, and go and update that memory, but that, of course, is a problem because the whole, you know, a, ma a big deal about Rust is the ownership discipline, which makes sure that at, for any piece of memory, there's only one owner at a time. Uh, and here, even though we've re uh, called return buffer and passed the vector back to Rust, we're continuing to use it. So basically, the problem here is that OCaml doesn't understand Rust's ownership discipline. Right? It doesn't know that this memory needs to be handled carefully, and you, know, you, can't, keep, you can't just stash away a pointer um, in the OCaml code when you're telling Rust that here you go, you can have your memory back. Okay, so uh, here's another slightly different example, um, but just to make a, a, a different point. Um, so uh, this is simpler. Um, I just have a structure S here in Rust, um, and I have two functions, F1 and F2, uh, that I'm not even gonna show there on the OCaml side. Um, so basically what we do, this, this example is about refactoring. So here I have a, a version of this code that um, basically allocates, uh, you know, I have the structure, I initialize the field to 10, and then I call F1 and I pass it X. And then I clone uh, x into y, and then go ahead and call uh, f2, and then return the cloned uh, structure. Now, if OCaml is behaving well and not stashing away pointers to Rust memory, then it would be perfectly okay to get rid of this clone. Um, we could just go ahead and, you know, um, straight away, basically the only thing that could happen is F2 could mutate X somehow, but if OCaml didn't stash away a pointer, then F2 shouldn't um, update my structure. So I should just be able to return X without cloning it. Okay, so. Um, but the problem is that if uh, OCaml does stash a pointer, it can, F2 can then go ahead and update X, all right? So it's just another way in which OCaml doesn't understand Rust's ownership discipline, but now it affects refactoring. Um, so let's talk about um, the bigger picture now. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. Um, when you have OCaml and Rust, um, how does a programmer go about figuring out if ownership is violated? Well, they really don't have much recourse other than to compile the code, link it together, and run it, and then see what errors crop up, and then debug, right? Because this nice ownership discipline has been violated, now you have to kind of go and sort of figure out what, what the issue was. Um, and the question I wanna ask, really, sort of the bigger question throughout this talk is, can we, not force programmers to have to do that? Can we instead bring this reasoning about you know, whether I can safely put together components and whether the other language will, will violate my uh, guarantees or invariants? Can we bring this sort of reasoning back to source level? Okay, I'm not gonna answer that question straight away. I'm gonna show you another problem. So, so far I was talking about two general purpose languages, but I don't wanna leave out the DSLs. Um, the same sort of situation applies. Here I'm gonna talk about DSLs in a very idealized way. I'm not gonna show you anything specific, but um, just to sort of give you a flavor for um, how the problem exists there too. Um, so imagine that we are implementing a web server. And uh, we're, we're doing it using some, uh, some nice DSL, so perhaps uh, we use a stateful uh, DSL to implement the listener, a terminating uh, uh, control CFG DSL for the protocol parser, uh, and maybe we're using some other third DSL to implement the spam system or something. Um, now, what I want to focus on here is that protocol parser. It's written in a terminating DSL. It would be a nice thing if uh, protocol parsing actually terminated, so this is a very careful choice. Okay, now, um, what we want to know is how these, um, how my st listener in the stateful DSL and my protocol parser in the terminating DSL interact. In particular, the concern here is, does the non-termination from the stateful language leak into my terminating language, right? because then the main guarantee, the main reason I'm using my DSL would be gone. Um, okay, and 
again, the picture is pretty much the same, even if these are DSLs, even if they're embedded DSLs. Um, you normally have to understand what's going on after compilation or macro expansion, either ma macro expansion into your host language or after compilation to some common target. Um, and then you have to run it and see what happens and see what goes wrong. And the question is the same again. Um, how can we allow this sort of reasoning to be brought up to the source level? Okay, so before I start giving you a proposal for how I think we should, um, let's just sort of um, take a look at one, uh, one way. Um, so one way that we could reason at the source level is we could start designing multi-languages that give you a semantics of interoperability between the two languages that we want to put together. So you could define a multi-language for interoperability between OCaml and Rust. That would take care of, I mean, it would be a lot of work, but it would take care of my first um, example. And people are working on this kind of thing. Um, uh, another, uh, and then for my second example, we could define uh, a semantic term of interoperability between the terminating DSL and the stateful DSL. But maybe you see where I'm going with this. <laughs> there are, if there are n different languages in the world and we need to define pairwise interoperability between all of them, this is an n squared problem. So <laughs> the idea does not scale. So this is a really large part of what I want to advocate today because I do not want to propose an N squared solution, okay? All right, so let's step back. I wanna say a few words before I, before I start talking about solutions. I wanna say a few words about um, the current state of programming language design and implementation, I guess. Um, so what do we currently do? Um, we have some nice languages out there, languages we like. Um, I've actually quite um, especially picked type-safe languages and put them up there. So we have ML, Rust, or languages that we at least believe are type-safe. We have ML, Rust, and Java. How do we... <laughs> Researchers go off and prove lots of uh, things to try to get there. Uh, but so, so how do we design these languages? Well, the way this work happens, uh, you know, is at least from an academic standpoint, we can talk about like ML. Um, with, with Rust, people are trying to prove the soundness. Um, with Java, after uh, Java came out, there were a whole bunch of researchers who went out there and tried to prove that it is in fact type sound. Um, so we designed these languages. They have a nice uh, type system and they guarantee type safety. So they give us a whole bunch of guarantees. They're good languages. They give us guarantees. We can rely on those guarantees when we write our code and we reason about our code. Tools that we use for refactoring can rely on those guarantees to, to do the refactoring and have some sense of, oh yeah, this, this refactoring should be legitimate because these are the properties of the language. So we do that. But then we go and implement these languages. Uh, now what I wanna say is that these language specifications are incomplete because they don't account for linking. Our design is done in a sort of silo mindset. Um, so then when we go and implement these languages, we open up these gigantic escape hatches. So with, you know, language like ML would have the CFFI, for Rust there's unsafe um, code, for Java there's the GNI. So we know that interoperability is something we need. We cannot have a language that is a silo. We need to interoperate with something, at least with C code. So we open up the escape hatches. All the guarantees that we so painstakingly proved, at least the researchers proved, um, they're gone. <laughs> at this point, we tell the programmers to be careful. <laughs> right? So this is not a good state of affairs. And the essence of my talk today is how do we change that state of affairs? So I want to advocate that we start to somehow rethink PL design instead of opening up a gigantic escape hatch with these FFIs that bring in all sort of uh, insecurities and vulnerabilities, how about we go about it in a more systematic fashion? Open up small principled escape hatches or principled, design principled FFIs. So let's not do this, yeah, CFFI and stuff. Um, let's talk about what a principled FFI might feel like. What, what would it be? Um, so if I want ML and Rust to talk to each other, I, the ML designer, would like to go teach ML something about Rust's ownership discipline, but I don't want to teach it Rust's ownership and borrowing discipline because that's way too complicated. Can I extract out the essence of Rust's ownership discipline and design an extension, an FFI for ML that is safe, but that introduces just the concept of linear types? 
Linear types basically give you this, uh, the, uh, this ability to reason about the fact that you have a resource and only one part of your program, let's say, will have uh, access or a capability for this resource at any point in time. If we have that, we should be able to get very, very far with, uh, with respect to safe interoperability with Rust. We don't need to know about the intricacies of borrowing in, on the ML side. Rust can handle that. Okay, so uh, that's a thesis. Um, these principled FFIs, I call them linking types. So um, what, what we want is um, to design linking types extensions that support safe interoperability with other languages. All right. Um, so suppose that uh, I sort of carry this, this idea further. Now let's say I wanted my ML code to interact with a pure terminating DSL, all right? So all programs written in that DSL will terminate. Um, well, ML doesn't really have a notion of purity. So if ML interacts with this DSL, it could easily pass a non-terminating function to the DSL, and then you, know, you have a program that doesn't terminate. Okay, so could I teach ML about one additional concept? Um, let's call it purity or termination. I'll call it pure. Um, so you see, I'm sort of opening up what I'm calling, I'm essentially advocating that we take ML and we provide the ML programmers with, a, with these simple features, these additional types that don't exist in the language already, okay? And we let them use that to annotate how they wish to interoperate with different categories of languages out there. And different categories takes me to my next point. What I'm advocating here is that we only need these linking types extensions to interact with behaviors or features that are not expressible in your language. So think of these linking types as a shadow sort of type system, a richer type system that's sitting in the back you know, of your language. Only you can now leverage these specifications to get better interoperability. Um, actually, let me see my thing. Uh, and, and so you should never need, if, if Rust has linearity and some other language has, has some concept which looks like linear types or ownership, then we should only need to add linear types to ML once and then be able to interact with that whole category of languages. Now this is an untested hypothesis, but that's the, that's the conjecture, or that's what I'm advocating. Okay, so, so linking types are about raising programmer reasoning back up to the source level. It's about giving the ML programmer a way to say, I am going to get a vector from Rust, and I'm going to treat it in a certain fashion so that I don't end up violating Rust's ownership discipline. Okay, so let me jump back to the example that I had. I'm gonna go through uh, the OCaml and Rust example, and then I'm going to go through uh, the, the DSLs example. Okay, so here's the OCaml and Rust. Uh, remember, Rust had uh, alloc buffer and return buffer, those two functions uh, that allocate a vector and then uh, the other one that receives the vector back from OCaml. So here's our code. Here was the problem. Uh, on this last line, after we've returned the vector to, to Rust, uh, we're, we still keep using it on the OCaml side, and therefore we violate Rust's ownership discipline. So the solution, which I've sort of hinted at already, is Let's design a linking type extension for OCaml that teaches OCaml about linear types, that adds linear types to the type language, in a sense, for OCaml. So let's see how, if we do that, how would we be able to, to solve this problem? Um, so say here I've sort of made up notation, but uh, you know, essentially what I, what I want is I want to be able to annotate on the OCaml side. I want to be able to say that uh, when I call alloc buffer, it gives me back a linear vector. It's linear, it can't be, you know, it has to be treated linearly. Only one part of the code can sort of manipulate it or own it at a time. Uh, and um, then uh, return buffer uh, will be given that linear vector back when we call return buffer. Now, um, when we call alloc buffer, we get back D. Now, because of the type up there uh, for alloc buffer, this has to be a linear vector. If it's a linear vector, uh, and I'm going to sort of assume that we, it's a linear vector with these three structures inside, but we're gonna treat the things inside the linear thing linearly as well. Uh, okay, so the pointer, the capacity, and the length. Uh, essentially what ends up happening by the time we get down here and we return the, the vector uh, using return buffer, what should happen is that the linear vector V 
along with all of those linear things underneath it, so to speak, the pointer, the capability, the length, and the actual buffer, the, the memory, um, should all, the ownership for that should all get passed back to Rust. Because it was linear, I can't keep it and give it away. So I, have to, I just gave it away. That means that this line should no longer type check because now I'm trying to use the buffer there to store at index one, and that's not allowed. So now, when I say that it won't type check, what I'm imagining is that when I designed that linking type extension and I taught OCaml about linear, linear types, I also designed an extended type checker that understands how to deal with linear types. And that extended type checker at the mention of linearity will basically catch this as a type error. Okay. Technically speaking, I just want to uh, sort of flash this slide and, and show you what, what's going on. I'm not extending OCaml in any way except for extending its type language. So you can think, I'm, I'm using colors to sort of keep these things apart. OCaml's types are in orange. And these linking types, there's this language of linking types, which is richer. And you can see that basically all I'm doing is I'm uh, adding this lin annotation, which I, I, you know, this optional linearity annotation that I can attach onto a type. So you can use it where you wish to, but you don't need to. It's optional. Uh, and this is the optional part. Uh, this, is, uh, to be, this should be done in a way so, uh, so that you know, programmers never have to use any linking type extended annotations unless they really want to interact with a feature where they wish to say something about you know, using resources linearly. Um, so there has to be a default translations from the types of the core language, or camel, into the linking type extended language. And I won't say more about that, but I'll come, come back to it with another example later. So going back to the web server. Um, so here I had this instance of a terminating DSL in, and a stateful DSL. And we want to know how we can reason about the interaction about, you know, we want to make sure that non-termination doesn't leak from the stateful DSL to the terminating DSL. Now, here I'm actually gonna, before I jump in and start uh, going through some details, um, sometimes you might want to, um, you know, just accept non-terminating functions. It really ought to be the programmer's choice. Sometimes escape hatches are good as long as they are done in a deliberate way, right? So when, when it's the CFFI, we really don't have a choice. We're not being very deliberate about any of it. Here I'm gonna to try to show, walk you through an example where uh, we're gonna to try to think about how to deliberately violate, uh, let's say, the, the termination discipline of the DSL. But let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna do this with um, a couple of really idealized languages. Um, so I have pure language, is my term, which is my stand-in for my terminating DSL. Um, and uh, it just has uh, you know, unit, integer, and function types. Uh, and I have a state lang, which is my state representative for my stateful uh, DSL, and that just has ML-style mutable references in addition to whatever we have in the orange language, in the pure language. Okay, and now the question is, how do we reason in the pure language when linking with the stateful language? Okay, now what does this word reason mean? So in particular, I wanna talk about reasoning about refactoring. Um, so up there, I have um, a, a function that takes uh, another function, a unit to int function, as an input, it's called C, and it calls C twice. Okay, um, so since we're in a pure language, um, this, uh, since we're in a pure language, uh, there are no effects. There's no memory I can update. There, I can't go into an infinite loop. So it should be perfectly okay to take uh, the, the program where I call C twice and rewrite it into the program where I call C only once. Those two should be perfectly equivalent, right? Uh, so that kind of refactoring should be justified if we stay in this pure language alone. All right. Um, so. But what happens when we go and link with some code that's been written in the stateful language, right? We wanna mix code from the two languages. So let's take a look at this example. So here I have a counter, uh, and it takes this uh, function f prime, which I'm going to, for which I'm gonna pass in some orange code, some code from the, from the pure uh, language. Okay, so what's happening is that my counter, uh, the blue code, 
Uh, so I have a stateful counter implemented in, state, in the stateful language. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm allocating a new reference, and then I'm basically, every single time uh, this uh, function is called, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to return a counter, which every single time it's called, it goes ahead and updates that counter, and then returns the number that's stored in the counter. Uh, and, um, and basically what happens is that if I go ahead and, and stick in the, or the pure language code, which calls C twice into the, you know, link with that, then I end up incrementing the counter twice. You see, because what's happened is that the orange function accepts a counter as input. That counter is stateful now. So calling it twice means I get a two back. But if I take the refactored code, I, I'm only calling the counter once, so I get a one back. So clearly the refactoring that was justified in the orange language alone, in the pure language alone, is no longer justified when I'm mixing things up with the stateful language. Okay, so yeah, when linking with that language, refactoring is no longer correct. So, um, so the question of is this particular, is a per particular refactoring correct, it kind of depends on a bunch of things, and it depends on what exactly it's linked with. So if we were linking that code up there, if the only C that we accepted as input was in fact a unit to int function from my pure language, then this refactoring is perfectly okay. All right? But if I'm linking with a unit to int function that's from my stateful language, well, it still looks like a unit to int function, but it's blue, it's not orange. It's from the stateful language. Being a unit to int function in the stateful language means that it is stateful, it's not pure. It might diverge, it might uh, allocate uh, a reference, et cetera, right? So if we link with a blue unit to int function, the stateful, a stateful one, then this refactoring is no longer okay because there's a potential for, um, for you know, two different calls, um, are effectful, so you can't just get rid of one of them. So what I'm proposing is that the programmer should be able to specify which one they want when they're building multi-language software. Because sometimes you might want, I only want to link with pure code. That's when you really, you know, you're worrying about the termination properties of your code. But sometimes you might want an escape hatch. So you might want to say, oh, I'm perfectly happy linking with stateful uh, unit to end functions, okay? So it shouldn't be that you have a nice language which gives you lots of guarantees and you, sh you never should be able, you know, you should never be able to step out of it. Okay, so the way I'm gonna do this is with a, um, I'm gonna sort of um, allow the programmer to specify which one they want is by developing a linking type extension for my pure language. So um, again, the pure language is, is orange and the linking type extension is this pink. And basically what I'm doing this time is um, in my linking types extended language, I have all the original types, unit, int, and functions, but for functions, I'm being careful about whether or not this function is pure. So the function has this type t to r zero t. The zero just means there are zero effects, okay? Um, so that's the type of a pure function. And at the bottom, you see the type of a stateful function. This is a function that takes a t as input and then returns some, if it terminates, it returns some value of that result type t, but it can potentially have effects. So it could go into an infinite loop or it could update some memory, et cetera. Okay, so that's my linking type extension. And here's what it buys me. Now, if the programmer has pure lang extended with the linking type extension in pink, the programmer suddenly has a vocabulary for saying which one they want. Do they want the orange unit to int function? If so, they can write it as, I want pure functions uh, that return an int. Uh, if they want the blue unit to int function, then they can write, I want the impure or the stateful functions that take a unit and return some value. Oh, that should have been int over there, uh, but can potentially have an effect. Oops, that messed up. Um, okay, so. Um, let's talk about refactoring for pure inputs then, going back to our example. If the programmer specified that the, the code, the function, needs to take a counter that is a pure function, then that refactoring is perfectly correct. And what happens is if the function is only allowed to take pure functions as input, then we are trying to pass in that blue code which is stateful. 
So it, this just won't type check. It's ill typed since C requires, since F requires pure code. Now, um, if on the other hand, the programmer had said, yeah, I'm in a pure language, but I'm perfectly happy to take stateful uh, functions as input, effectful functions as input. Then they would annotate uh, their input with unit to effectful um, function that returns an integer. Now, in this case, this refactoring is not okay, right? And what's happened is that the programmer, by writing down that annotation, is suddenly aware of the fact that this refactoring is okay and will not do it because they can see the type. So it gives you a local way of thinking about what refactoring you're allowing and what you're not, right? So um, it's, it's giving programmers control uh, and information. So in this case, um, back to our example, if we have uh, the function C annotated with, I'm, you know, I'm happy to accept stateful functions, then this code is perfectly well typed because, well, um, F accepts stateful code, so, so we're okay. All right. Now, I want to come back to this minimal annotation burden thing, uh, which I mentioned earlier as well, but I'll say a little bit more about it now. Um, so what we have here, <laughs> is I have a function in my orange language, and my annotation says that I'm happy to accept unit to int functions that are pure. Now, that it would be a real pain if programmers had to write that down, right? For that, they should just be able to write the orange unit to int, okay? So when we design these linking types extensions, one of the principles is that there should be a default translation. We should be able to provide a default translation that looks something like this. Um, when you design the linking type extension, in this case I'm calling it pure lang plus, plus s, uh, you provide a default translation that turns orange types into their corresponding pink types. The core language types into the linking types extended language types. And here you can see that the in only interesting thing that's happening is that we are noting that any orange t1 to t2 function, the pure language functions, is going to be documented as in our linking types extended language as a function that takes a t1, returns a t2, but is pure, right? The zero indicates that it won't have any effects. Um, I'm gonna skip that part. Okay, so, so far, I've talked about linking types extensions. So this gives programmers a way to go and sprinkle in additional annotations if they wish to. Okay, so I said I want to bring, sor I want to bring, back, uh, bring reasoning back to the source level, so this takes me a little bit of the way, but it doesn't take me all the way. And here's the next big thing that I want to talk about. How do we catch cross-language type errors? And maybe a question is, have we caught them already based on what I've said so far? The answer is no. So let's just go back to our example. Um, so we had this example where, you know, now that I've sprinkled in linearity annotations all over the place, um, my OCaml code cannot make use of this buffer at the end after returning uh, the vector to, to Rust. But what if my ML programmer doesn't feel like sprinkling in the linear type annotations? How does my, on the Rust side, how does Rust know, or the Rust programmer, might be a different person, how do they know that their guarantees have not been violated. So what I want to emphasize is we're still really in the same place as before. Because if the ML programmer doesn't use my nice linking types extensions, I still have no way of telling the Rust programmer that something bad is going to happen. At least not until they've compiled and linked, et cetera, right? And, and then tried to wade through the errors. Okay, so we need a couple more things. We need one more big piece of the puzzle. Um, so, um, Oh, I just said this, just because OCaml programmer can annotate does not mean she will. Okay, so how do we catch these errors across languages um, when the expectations of the more richly typed language, in this case, you know, Rust with its ownership discipline, when those expectations are not met? How do we warn that programmer? So the answer is type-preserving compilation. So type-preserving, when you, when you build a type-preserving compiler, um, you take programs in your, type programs in your high-level language and you translate them. You don't just type check the program and throw away the types. You instead take all the types and translate them with the code to lower and lower uh, levels of the compiler. 
um, Java, for instance. Java to Java bytecode is a type-preserving translation. That's, that part is a type-preserving compiler. Same thing for um, C sharp to, to the CIL, et cetera. Um, but the, the issue there is that you know, those are rather sort of front-end passes. Uh, byte code, Java bytecode is still very high level. There's still a lot more compilation to be done. But this idea has been carried uh, down all the way to assembly. In fact, this work dates back to the mid-90s. So what I'd like to, to propose is that we use type-preserving compilers because um, these, and I'll tell you how it solves the problem about catching uh, cross-language errors in a second, but these type, essentially this idea of having type annotations in the target code is really powerful because it gives you specifications at the low level, which tell you something about the invariance, and it can be in high level invariance translated into the appropriate low level invariance, and you can use those type annotations to then check uh, certain things at link time, and perhaps disallow linking if you need to, if your invariants aren't met, or if your requirement specifications aren't met. Okay, so let's go back to um, OCaml and Rust. So uh, I'm just gonna show the, the basic idea with a simple example. So here I have my alloc buffer in Rust. And remember, now I'm saying, um, oh, alloc buffer in, in, in Rust, actually that lin annotation should not have been there, sorry, that's a mistake. It's, it's just, on the Rust side, alloc buffer just has the type void to vec, right? But vectors are owned in Rust, okay. Um, on this side, let's say my OCaml programmer did not sprinkle in a lin annotation on vec, okay? So um, the OCaml pro programmer still claims that alloc buffer is, takes a void and, and returns uh, a vector, but it's not linear. So how does type-preserving compilation help me catch errors? Well, when I translate um, the type for my alloc buffer on the Rust side, what I should get down here and mind you, even though that should just say void to vec, after type preserving uh, compilation, the type that I should get for my alloc buffer function would be void to lin vector. What I'm assuming here is that my typed target language understands linearity. And when someone compiles Rust, if, it, if someone is doing a proper type preserving compiler for Rust, they would take all of the stuff about owner, ownership and borrowing and translate them into an appropriate uh, linearity type discipline in the target. So it's a tough thing to do, but it buys you a lot, okay? Um, so if we have, uh, if we use a type preserving compiler, that's the annotation we would get for alloc buffer. Now, if the OCaml programmer did not say that alloc buffer is void to linear vec, even though we have linking types on that side, then the type uh, preserving compiler will produce this type on the uh, OCaml side. It will just be void to vector. And because void to vector does not match void to lin vector, this means that we can't allow linking to proceed. Some violation is being, uh, it, you know, some, something, is something bad is happening. Something is violating Rust's expectations, okay? So, so at least, so it gives us a sort of long path, right? We're going from the top, we're doing type-preserving compilation, but then we're creating a medium where we have the right information that we can use to match things up and figure out if the expectations on the Rust side are met or not, okay? All right, um, yeah, these types don't match. Uh, so I wanna say something a little bit more generally, um, stepping away from just uh, OCaml and Rust about how type-preserving compilation helps us find uh, these cross-language type errors. I'm not gonna do it with explicit uh, types and showing you how to translate them, but I'm gonna do it with shapes. So it should, essentially the idea is if you have one language, language one over here, and you have language two over there, let's say in language one, I write a function that accepts a star and returns a triangle, all right? Now, on the language two side, I know how to write a kind of a star. Okay, and that's why what I want to do is I want to take this function and link it up with that star which acts as the input to my function, okay? Now, the idea of type-preserving compilation here is that when I compile language one and compile language two, um, if, how, however I translate um, my star on this side, my blue language star, my language two star, if I end up getting a star of this particular shape in the target language, okay, 
And if that star matches up the star that this guy expects, then I'm good. Then I can allow this linking to proceed, okay? Because the, the types match. All right. If, on the other hand, um, the types don't match. So, for instance, um, lang2, the star is still translating as before, but perhaps uh, there's something about this particular language where the translation for the purple star is, is not that red star. It's in fact some sort of a red circle and it doesn't match up. So the expectations of this function are that it wants, at least when translated down to the target level code, what it wants has this circle shape, <laughs> circle type if you will, um, and it doesn't match up with what it's getting on the other side. Okay, so that in a nutshell is the intuition for how type preserving compilation can help us catch these errors. Okay, so these types don't match and uh, we should report an error. Now, the story doesn't end there. Um, once, you, once we've built these type preserving compilers, right now I've just shown you a sketch of an idea that you know, if we have this information down at the target level, then we should be able to match things up. And if we can match things up, then we can report errors. So it's, it's sort of like information's coming down from the tops, it's going like this, and we can report an error over to this side, right? Okay, um, so in the long term, this information, at least having this information, should be extremely valuable. We'll still need to do a lot of work in terms of IDEs that take this information and nicely display it to users, right? Because if you really want to build multi-language software, you want the programmer sitting at the top and not having to worry about any of this low-level information, right? So we need tools, we need IDEs that, that take this information and appropriately communicate the problems to programmers, okay? But hopefully the shape idea gives you a sense of how we might be able to do that. Okay, so let's move on. The next point I want to make is that we don't just want type-preserving compilation, we in fact want refactoring-preserving compilation. So in other words, if you, the programmer, are relying, if you expect certain uh, rewriting, certain refactorings to be correct in your source language, given the properties of the source language, they might be type safety guarantees um, or whatever else, uh, and you have not used one of these linking types principled escape hatches, to say that, ah, I'm okay with this refactoring not holding, right, because you can do that. We saw that with the example with the blue and orange languages, right, the pure and stateful languages. If I choose to, I can say, oh, I'm happy to accept a stateful function, which means that I'm happy to give up on a particular refactoring pattern, okay? So if I choose to um, give up on certain refactoring, then regardless, whatever I chose, I, the programmer, programmer is God, compiler writer should not be making decisions. Um, so whatever refactoring the, the programmer uh, wants, they can indicate with, with these annotations, and then we want to take the programmer's wishes and make sure that the refactorings that they expect to hold in the source program still hold after the code is compiled down to the target. Okay, so, why is this tough? Um, well, basically, what happens is that at the target level, you have assembly or something sufficiently low level that you know, your low level language can do lots of things that you can't possibly do in a high level language. You could have various jumps and disrupt control flow and try to you know, basically violate uh, correctness of refactorings that way. So in order to preserve the correctness of refactoring, you have, conceptually speaking, what the compiler must do is prevent linking with all code that could possibly tell the difference between, you know, version one of some code and its refactored counterpart, okay? Now, um, the key idea, and this is, you know, is that we can actually use type-preserving compilers and type-preserving translations in a way that we can use them as a sort of lever to turn the knob and say, ah, uh, the type, something of type T translates to something of this complicated type, uh, but it's linking with something that I really don't want to be linking with. Hmm, is there a way to take this complicated type and make it a bit more tight and so that I prevent that linking? And all of that happens when you design your compiler's type translation, okay? So basically what I'm saying is that the compilers should be following uh, the directives of the source level types in some sense. Um, but I'm giving you an escape hatch. Linking types are the escape hatch. If the programmer says that uh, they never want to link with code that they um, can't, you know, um, 
that violates refactorings, great. But if the programmer says that they're happy with the linking with certain things that violate refactorings, then the compiler should do that. Okay? All right. So this idea of refactoring preserving compilation is also known as equivalence preserving compilation or secure compilation in the, in the literature. And there's been quite a bit of work on it recently. Okay. So I've talked about a lot of high level ideas. I've sort of laid out a. Um, you know, as the abstract said, this talk is about how do we change the status quo when it comes to building multi-language software. So this is, this is a talk about a lot of pieces that, that don't exist yet. They exist in certain partial forms. We know how to do type-preserving compilers. We have uh, had a lot of research in the last decade on how to do um, these refactoring-preserving or secure compilers, um, but we're not all the way, for instance, to assembly yet. Uh, so what I want to do next is give you, a, and, and even with linking types extensions, we have a lot of experience in the last couple of decades designing very rich type systems that can keep these different sorts of effects you know, um, separate from each other, purity, state, um, control, et cetera. So this sort of uh, agenda is really about how do we take all of those pieces and, and put them together to make multi-language software easier to build. So let me tell you about ongoing work. Um, so basically, in my group, uh, this is the mo uh, next most direct thing um, that we're you know, sort of working on. So this is a Mulberry project, Mul for multi-language. Um, so what uh, we're currently trying to do is take um, ML and figure out what exactly linking types extensions should look like that give us the right kind of interoperability with Rust in the way that I've tried to sketch out today. Uh, we are also taking a pure language and designing a separate linking type extension uh, to interact with, pure, uh, with features from that pure uh, language. And to put all of this together, uh, what's going to make it work is if we can build type preserving and refactoring preserving compilers all the way down to our very richly typed target language. So we are building this on top of uh, WebAssembly. Um, and now there are a lot of criteria that go into this, this um, you know, richly typed wasm that we are trying to design. Uh, basically, if you're trying to take languages at the at high level languages that are so different from each other, one is pure, one is stateful, one has linearity, um, and you, know, you might have more. Uh, in fact, I'll show you more. Uh, then what you really need at the target level is a language with a, with a type system that's so rich that it can keep all of these different effects, so to speak, apart. So for instance, that, langu that target language should be able to say, this is that component's memory. You better not touch it, OK? There have to be specifications that we can write for making sure that, that, and that that's the case. Um, or uh, for just encapsulating state uh, and uh, keeping that away from pure code so that you know, effects don't leak into pure code. Um, in a longer term sense, uh, we'd actually like to attempt uh, to uh, compile Galena down to the same uh, richly typed target language. Uh, and my student, um, William Bowman, has actually been doing some work on uh, type preserving compilation. Oh, sorry, I put Galena. The Koch theorem prover, which is used for verification <laughs> in the community. Um, how do we compile that so that we can actually have high assurance verified code mixed together with, let's say, low assurance uh, ML code, et cetera, without violating uh, all of the high assurance guarantees that you painstakingly prove when you do um, verification? Um, now, I'm sure you've noticed that I haven't said anything about untyped languages <laughs> throughout this talk. Um, <laughs> That's sort of uh, intentional because um, in my group, at least, we're trying to tackle um, how do we mix different typed languages with very different features. We're trying to take that as a first step. Uh, but there are ideas out there which, um, you know, sort of um, that we could use in order to, to make uh, statically typed and dynamically typed languages mixed together. Uh, so for instance, if we are compiling uh, Scheme and C or something uh, down the road um, to the same uh, typed target language, conceptually at least what we would need is we would need this richly typed WASM that we want to design to, to be able to interact with less richly typed WASM or untyped or dynamically typed WASM. Um, not dynamically typed. WASM is already a type safe language, but with a very minimal um, type safety guarantee, whereas what I'm imagining on the richly typed side is much stronger guarantees. So this really is an instance of gradual typing. Um, and uh, one of my students, Max New, is actually working on, uh, on foundations of gradual typing that we're hopeful will sort of um, down the road lead to some clues for that. Um, 
Okay. So uh, the other thing is, um, for ML, we're interested in uh, looking at interactions with a language like Scheme. So our ML right now, at least, we uh, don't uh, sort of have first class uh, control in the language. Um, so this gives us an opportunity to experiment with designing a linking type extension that lets us deal with that. So um, let me just sort of uh, give you some takeaways at the end. Um, so what I've talked about today is that multi-language software should be easier to build. Um, but easier said than done. Um, so uh, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, you've found this idea of uh, linking types uh, useful. Uh, basically, I think that it gives us a way to rethink all of language design and start thinking carefully about what principled FFIs we could add to our existing languages so that we don't just open up a gigantic escape hatch and let all sorts of bugs in. Um, uh, but in order to make all of this vision a reality, in order to make all of the pieces fit together, what we need is principled software tool chains for multi-language software. And for that, things like type preserving and refactoring preserving compilation are key. Um, and because they also give you this uh, power to, to report cross-language type errors and allow programmers to reason at the source level. Uh, okay, I will leave you with one last slide. So this is, uh, this has a link to my group and I uh, put pictures of all of my students up there. And in particular, let me call out uh, Daniel Patterson. Uh, his dissertation is uh, the one on this topic that, you know, that the bulk of this talk was about. So all five of them are here. So uh, if you can't find me, please find them. They will be happy to tell you in more detail uh, what, we, what we are up to. And you can find publications and other information on that website. Thanks so much.